something is rising. Can you feel it? In a world fractured by division and despair, more than ever, America needs a revival of godly men. Our nation faces problems that can only be overcome when men of integrity, promise-keeping men, fulfill their destinies as godly husbands, fathers, and leaders. We're calling on men everywhere, all of us, to boldly rise up and stand together as the men God intended us to be. Today, we unite with communities across the country for a virtual experience that will empower the nation to stand stronger and walk with Christ. This digital global gathering is an event to share with friends and bring men together, even in spaces that are socially apart. Today, men all across the globe gather on a live stream in their homes with men's groups and at simulcast locations hosted by churches to experience the Promise Keepers 2020 Global Digital Experience. Today we'll be hearing from pastors, thought leaders, and advocates of change around the nation. Promise Keepers is building on the past to redefine the future. Together we will bless our families, strengthen our churches, transform our communities, and reignite a new generation. And it's already rising. Can you feel it? Men, welcome to Promise Keepers 2020, a virtual experience. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jeff Razor, and I'm so privileged to be the host to help guide you through this conference, this online conference where men have gathered from all around the world to hear what God wants to say to them in this season. Now, I know if you're like me, you've waited a long time for this. We've been waiting for Promise Keepers to once again step into the forefront of culture and speak to us as men to share with us what God is doing as a vessel into to our hearts so we can experience hope and joy and transformation. I want you to know it's been worth the wait. And it's been worth the wait because you're worth the wait. Your life, your ministry, your career, your family, your legacy is all on the line right now in this season of world history. And it has been worth the wait because your life has been worth the wait. And God wants to do something miraculous in you in this conference. So I'm so glad you've waited it out with us. And I welcome you to this experience. Now, it's been a battle. It's been a battle for you to get here. It's been a battle for promise keepers to get here, but we are here. And here's what I know about the uniqueness of this moment, that Promise Keepers has made it here to this event. You have made it here to this event. And no matter how you got here, whether you've been waiting for years for Promise Keepers to step in again, or whether your buddy just asked you to come to this event yesterday, God has a reason for you to be here. God is gonna speak through the messages, through the worship, through the transformational thoughts that come through this screen into your heart so that you can find your place and your identity in Christ. And so that you can use that identity to transform from the world around you. So here's what I know. It's been difficult times. That, that is the understatement of the year that it's it difficult times right now. But here's what I know. God has always raised up powerful ministries when there is difficult times going on. In fact, Promise Keepers birthed when there was difficult times going on in the lives of men. Promise Keepers is back, you're back in these difficult times and God wants to do the miraculous. So I could tell you all about the artists and speakers that you're gonna see, but here's what the heart is behind all of that. I know every single one of them has felt humbled and privileged to step into this moment with you to say, use me to allow God to use me to transform your life. And so you're going to see some amazing speakers and artists. We're going to worship together. We're going to hear God's word together. But here's the truth. We want to be surrendered to all that God has for us. And so that's where I want to start us. You see, I want to ask you to go ahead and stand up. And I know that might sound awkward coming out over this online virtual experience, but you might be in church with a bunch of friends, or you might be at a friend's house, or you may have just clicked it online 
mind, I'm just gonna ask you to stand up and take a, as a man, take a physical posture to represent something I'm asking you to do. And I'm gonna ask you to hold out your hands and I'm gonna ask you to surrender anything that could be holding you back from what God wants to do in your life. And this moment, this surrender is the posture of expectancy. Maybe you came expectant already waiting for God to do something amazing, or maybe you came with your arms crossed wondering what this was all about. Either way, I'm just gonna ask you, open your arms. And as I pray, and as we enter into worship, would you allow God to bring those walls down? So Father God, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you that you got us here. Thank you that you got me here. Thank you that you got these men here. That There's a reason we've made it this far. And you didn't bring us this far to leave us here. You've got so much more. So God, as we surrender, we ask you to build our expectancy, build the, the eyes and ears of our heart that we might see and hear what you want us to see and hear. And God, as we move into worship, we ask you to do the miraculous in and through us in Jesus' name. Men, stay standing and join with us as Promise Keepers Worship Band leads us into worship. Promise Keepers, my name is Calvin Noel and I have the honor and the privilege to lead you in worship today. And I just ask that as you watch, whether you're at home, whether you're with your brothers, whether you're in the car, whether you're driving, wherever you are, I believe that God is accessible. I believe that God is close by. And as we worship today, our main goal is to touch heaven and to encounter his presence like never before. So wherever you are, will you just join us, sing out, have a good time, and let's enter in his presence. Amen? Amen.
sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. I sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. I sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. We will praise a little louder.
Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle And I know, I know You never will Oh, yeah, oh Thank you, Lord You never lost a battle A battle. Never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never will. You never will. You never lost a battle. 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 You never will. You never will. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never will. Hey, welcome to the Promise Keepers 2020 event. Well, as you can see, this isn't AT&T Stadium, but you are going to be blessed by this program anyway, because this is not going to be your normal Christian program. A lot of you guys are watching this for many different reasons. Some of you guys are watching this because you love Promise Keepers from the 90s and uh, the great ministry from Coach Bill McCartney. Some of you are watching this because you love the Lord and you just want to come together as men to worship our Lord. Some of you don't even know who God is, and you're just curious, and you're looking for answers. And some of you are struggling. Some of your marriages are struggling. Some of you are struggling in your life right now. We're going to take on issues in a real way the way men do. This is not going to be churchy. We're not trying to make you more moral. We're not trying to make you more religious. We want to tell you that we found grace and joy through our Lord Jesus Christ that the way to being a better man is to being a better disciple of Jesus. And when you become a better disciple of Jesus, then you become the man you've always wanted to be. You won't become the man you want to be through self-effort, through self-help, through a strong will, or by trying to obey some rule somebody somewhere told you need to do. The way you become the man you want to be is by knowing Jesus Christ, the grace and joy he has. And I know some of you out there feel like you're not good enough for Jesus. I'm telling you that you are. You're going to hear some really authentic stories 
from men who have failed, but who have been brought up by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be amazing what he can do in your life. So buckle your chin straps. This is not going to be your typical program. This is going to be an experience, authentic, real, by failed men, telling you where we found joy in Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Peter walked into a room filled with Gentiles. He had never been in a meeting like that before because as far as he was concerned, it was unlawful for him as a Jew to do it. But he had been prompted by God who said to him, you're going to have an encounter and I want you to know that I don't want you to call anything unclean that I've made holy. And so Peter prepared himself in some way to have an encounter. He walks into the room of the home of Cornelius, a centurion, who lived in that particular part of the world and who was hungry to hear from God. And as he walked in, Peter saw something that he hadn't seen before, and it awakened something in him. And he said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The encounter that the Apostle Peter had 2,000 years ago would be similar to the encounter that many of us had about 25 years ago when we had our first entrance into a stadium event where thousands and thousands of men were gathered together in an assembly of celebration and worship. It was festive, it was exciting, it was glorious, and it was not anything that had ever taken place before. My experience was in uh, at the Pontiac Silverdome in April. And when I walked in, 74,000 guys were there and the atmosphere was electric. And I, I think about something that Jesus asked the blind man once he had prayed for him. And he said to him, what do you see? And of course, this guy said, well, I see men like trees. And Jesus says, well, let me pray again. And I think many times we are asked that question internally when we come into a meeting and we see difference of faces, cultures, backgrounds, races, classes, all gathered together in one place to do one thing, and that's to celebrate the most unique person in the world, and that's Jesus Christ. I walked into that stadium, and I've never been the same. My life was changed. My perception of who God could use and when he could use them. My background at that time, and still is, it's still my background, is that I was a classic Pentecostal. Classic Pentecostal. And I knew what, quote, church was like, and I knew what the presence of God was like. I knew what good music was like. But the thing that I loved about that moment was you encountered such a rich diversity of men from every kind of background. And the amazing thing was they were all getting along. It was an exciting time. I remember a story of a pastor who was working on his message and he'd been trying to encourage his young son who kept pestering him, Dad, you promised me you're going to play with me. And so he kept shooing him off. And then finally he said, he saw a piece of paper lying on the floor, large newspaper, and on the, on the full page of the paper was a picture of the globe of the world. He had a bright idea, and he took that picture and he ripped it into about 50, 70 pieces or so, and he mixed them all up and he gave them to his son. And he said, now, he says, put this together, and as soon as you get it together, I'll come and play football with you. And so he's thinking he's got 30 minutes, and this kid walks out of the room. He's excited, and about five minutes his, his dad hears this knock at the door and he says, what do you want? He says, I got it together, dad. He says, you did not. He says, come and see. And so he walks out and lying on the floor is this picture of the globe, perfectly assembled. He said, how did you do it? He said, it was easy, dad. On the other side of that picture, there was a picture of a man. And when I got the man together, I got the world together. What Promise Keepers has learned is that if you can get men together in terms of their wholeness, in terms of their identity as men, in terms of being comfortable with being a worshiper, loving God, you can get the world together. And we saw that. There's another passage of scripture that I also think of when I'm thinking of Promise Keepers and gatherings of men. And it's in the book of Micah, chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. It reads like this. 
I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. They will be noisy with men. It was such an, an incredible passage. I'm looking at it and saying, that's a PK event. And here's what it says. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, go out by it. So their king goes on before them and the Lord is at their head. Men were encouraged. Men were stimulated. It was an idea, a revelation, a wonderful experience whose time had come. There were these ingredients that guys were comfortable with, stadiums football stadiums, and they could be there and they could, they could see things that they had seen in one circumstance, but all of a sudden now they're not seeing men run up and down the field playing football, but they're seeing men in many cases standing, many with their tears flowing down as they were touching the grace and the goodness of God. When I came to that first one, I felt like Barnabas who came to Antioch, the very first multicultural church in the New Testament. And Barnabas, when he saw what had taken place, how many different people were gathered together, it was no longer just a Jewish church. It was a church that experienced and was enjoying all of the various ethnicities that lived in that time. And this is what Peter said. I see now that God will honor and he will believe and he will confirm anyone out of every nation who fears the Lord. What happens in a Promise Keepers event that began in the late, middle 1900 or 1994, 95, uh, right into where we are today. There's a hunger that men are having right now to pursue God with everything that's in us. We are bankrupt for ideas. We're bankrupt for how we pull people together. We're discussing various issues of the divisions that are in our world right now. And our challenge is to understand that only Jesus can solve those divisions. But when we have a promise like we, we have in Psalm 133, where the psalmist says how beautiful and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And then he makes this statement at the end of it, for there God commands the blessing. You cannot think of another place when people are gathered in unity. You can't think of another place where there is a commanded blessing. Something happens. There are ingredients that, that were necessary for promise keepers to, to work and to, to do what it did. I've watched it for years. I've watched how we've done it. I watched the various gatherings that people could worship. I remember being in a particular stadium in Missouri and it rained all day and we would take a break and then it would rain again. And so finally, we just saw guys out on the field with their umbrellas up. There was a passion that they had to be together because whenever they left that event, they were always going to look back on it and find something that meant something to them. I visited a number of churches that were not uh, necessarily Pentecostal or charismatic, but they were churches that had been touched by the fever of the Promise Keeper event. Something significant took place in those men. Those guys would go back and they would evangelize their pastors and they would evangelize other men. And the event grew and grew and grew until we came to 1997, where one and a half million, one and a quarter million guys were gathered in Washington, D.C. And I can recall standing on the platform in the mall, looking at guys with their hands raised, looking at guys on their knees and remembering some of the anecdotes that were that we heard in those days where one of the policemen came over to a guy and he says, here, come here. And this guy walked over to his car and he says, put your head in my car. And he said, do what? He says, here, put your head in my car. And so he leans into the car and he says, what do you hear? He says, I don't hear anything. He says, and that's what I want you to know. He says, I've been sitting here for the past three hours and I've not got one radio call from anybody that's in difficulty. I don't think we understood the, the power and the presence of God that the passion of men who are hungry to see something happen in their own lives, in their own family, to become what God created them to be. 
one of the guys who started uh, along with Coach McCartney is a friend of mine who's in heaven now. His name is James Ryle. And James has this amazing definition for grace. He says, grace is the empowering presence of God that enables me to be what he has created me to be and to do what he has called me to do. I watch James, I watch Coach, I watch a number of the men, either those who led in worship, those who preached the word, those who shared faith, the praying people who are in the background, how much some of this has integrated itself into the very fabric of the, what the church is today. I can recall getting on a plane with my promise keeper's cap on and I would be stopped by a flight attendant who would say to me, you don't know how much your events have changed my husband. I've got a new guy. And I could tell you again, story after story of how God has done that. The sweeping arch of what God began in the in the 1990s, I believe is something that God wants to do in this time together. And I want you, I know where you are, you, you're gathered some maybe in another assembly, you're watching by way of video, maybe in an auditorium someplace, or maybe you just tuned in to see it and you just came across something that caught your attention. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us this weekend. You're going to hear truths. You're going to hear insights that will change the way you see life. And I believe that hope will spring up in all of us to believe that no matter what we see going on around us, there is a Jesus who, if we wake him up, he will look at the storm and say, be still. There's a need that you and I have to find our way back to God and to bring men with us. Wherever you are, I'm going to encourage you to seek God, to pursue him, because we're not dead. We are alive. And I believe that this is the season that God is saying, I am doing a work in this church. And, the, and I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. This church, men, noisy men, filled with the Spirit, ready to worship, filled with passion, and ready to pursue their own unique purpose in God. God bless you. I'm excited. I trust that you will be too. Man, every time I see Bishop Garlington, it brings a smile to my face and a warmth to my heart. I still remember the very first time I saw Bishop Garlington speak at a Promise Keepers event. He said something that I will never forget. He, he indicated to us, he shared a truth with us that goes like this. Men, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. You see, eternity is part of who we are. It's within the very fabric of who we are. And in this life, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And as he gave the history of promise keepers and reminded us of those foundations. I want to remind you that as you participate in this event, as you allow God to speak to you, the spirit of who you are is going to be transformed in the world, physical world around you. And I can't wait to watch it happen. Now, as we transition from that history, I want to move us into a powerful message. And I want to introduce you to one of our promise keepers ministry partners. This ministry is called Core Unites. And if you go back into that history, you may have not known this name, but Randy Phillips was the founding president along with coach Bill McCartney. He joined the team shortly after it got founded as the president in Promise Keepers in all those early days, those first big years in all the stadiums. And since those days, he has been pioneering work as one of the founding fathers in the men's ministry movement. And over the last number of years, him and his team have created a fresh way to help men connect in community through the power of film. Their ministry is named Core United. Nights. I want to introduce you to the story of Alfonso, where you're going to hear through this film, the story of God transforming a man's life, just like yours, just like mine, and calling him into ministry in a way he never expected. It's a powerful film. And from there, you're going to get to hear Miles McPherson share the good news that's going to transform your life. So check out this story about Alfonso right now. God just opened up this door for me to become the assistant chaplain to the New York Yankees. I started meeting guys like Derek Jeter, Cole O'Neill, Mariano Rivera, and all these great ball players. All those years that I was in the street, I was smoking pot, I was doing heroin. On my best day, I couldn't put that together. It was God. My name is 
My dad, no, just an extremely abusive man. He beat my mom almost every day. Beat us almost every day. From the moment I could remember something, the first thing I remember is him, you know, abusing my mother. I could go back maybe when I was three, four years old, have memories of my father taking an ax and tearing up the house. Every time I would see him hit her, I'd kind of hide in the corner. I would go to the closet or I would go under the bed. And I would always say to myself, one day I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna man up. And I'm gonna take care of this dude. My father had come in uh, from the outside. He was drunk and he asked my mother for something. She answered him back. She didn't like the way he answered her. And I'm just watching this go down. And I determined in my mind that if he hits her, this is the day I'm gonna man up. He picked up this broomstick to hit her and I rolled up on him. And I hit him and he fell. He got up and he ran out. That was the best day of my life. I said, finally, this man is gone. We could have some peace. And so a day went by and two days went by. And I'm like really feeling good, man, you know? On the third day, my, my mother said to me, listen, we got a little problem here. Is your father is coming back home, okay? Under one condition, you gotta go. I remember staying out in the street that night, several nights. If you have to eat out of a garbage can, that's what you do. You know, if you have to go into that abandoned building, that's what you do. There was an old saying when I was growing up, only the strong survives. That's the way it was. Now I'm in my 20s, you know, so a friend of mine got me a job. They had a print shop, they paid more. I was working there. I was smoking pot, I was sniffing cocaine and doing heroin, but I would get clean. I promised my wife never again, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Then one day, they hired a new supervisor. And he came up to me, he said, my name is Otto Lang. He stuck out his hand and he said, I want to tell you something. He had my hand and he held it a little too tight and I didn't like it. He said, I want to tell you that Jesus loves you. He said, don't come to me with that Jesus junk, man. So if you want to have a friendship with me, you keep that Jesus junk to yourself. But this dude would come every single morning with that Jesus stuff, man. I really gotten really bad with drugs. And my wife was going to leave me. And I called him up. I said, Otto, this is Willie. He says, I know, man. I told him the situation. He said, why don't you come to church? And I made a deal with God. If you are who you say you are, and you could do what people tell me you could do, if you could get this habit off my back, and my wife doesn't leave me, nobody will ever serve you like me. I felt like this thing had lifted off me. This is almost 40 years ago. I have never taken drugs since then. So I said to her, well, <laughs> why are you calling me, man? You know, I couldn't care less. I hope he dropped dead. I hung up the phone. Maybe five, 10 minutes later, I just really feel this prompting from God telling me, go to the hospital to see him. I told God, I ain't going nowhere. I ate out of garbage cans because of this dude. I lived in abandoned buildings and woke up in the morning because rats were biting my feet. And this is the dude you want me to go have some pity for? You must be out of your mind. Long story short, you know I went. We get upstairs, walk in the room, and here's the dude that beat the crap out of me. And I say to him, you know, um, all this junk just happened, man. Why don't we just put it behind us, you know, and I forgive you, man, for what you've done. But the issue here is that you need to get right with God. 
I said a prayer, and he fell back into a coma. And I said to him, if, if you want to receive Christ, move your hand, move your head, move something so I know that. And he moved his hand, stayed in the coma. That night, he died. I never felt like I couldn't get to where God wanted me to get to. Like there was something just blocking it. I couldn't figure it out. You know, where do you go in neutral? Nowhere. I almost felt like God had put his hand on my hand and popped it in the verse. Once I forgave him. See, because forgiveness is really not for that person. It's for you. I love the word of God. I think there's an 18-inch difference between what you believe here and you transfer it here to your heart. Man. I read the word of God just about every day. You know, Psalms 119 says, Thy word I have hidden in your heart. So I mean, I sin against God. I can't tell you how many times I read my Bible in the morning, went outside, and that day ran into a struggle. And that verse I read bailed me out. See, this, this word pastor, reverend, chaplain, it don't mean a darn thing. Don't help me none. I had a guy cut me off not so long ago. I chased this dude down to the red light. I can't tell you what I was thinking. I wasn't chasing him to get him saved. And when I caught up to him, I told him, roll your window down, my man. See, but then I love how the truth of God comes. Uh, the Bible says, at the moment of temptation, God will always give you the way of escaping. You know, God said, yo, stupid, what are you doing, man? You're about to bang this up. And make it my business to stay in the Word of God. Now, also make it my business to hear God speak to me when he speaks to me and respond right then. So my father may have never told me he loved me, but my heavenly father tells me every single day, Willie, you're special. And I love you. I have something special for you to do that only you could do. So I started ministering to young men through sports in the middle of the projects. And within a couple of years, we had over 200 boys in our program. We sent around 20 boys to Bible college. And we saw hundreds of young men come to the Lord, man. And now I'm doing chapel with this guy, Mariano Rivera, the greatest relief pitcher ever in the history of baseball. We, for 18 years, did a one-on-one -on -one Bible study in his house. He is my brother. He is my friend. In my darkest days, he's been there with me. In his darkest days, I've been there with him, man. We love each other and care for each other deeply. But that's God. I have absolutely no schooling in how to work with athletes. I have no schooling on how to deal with millionaires. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, you acknowledge him, and he will direct your path, man. You know, my father used to call me, he said, You know, he used to tell me, you never amount to nothing. God tells me I'm special. And I'm using what the enemy meant for evil. I'm using now, man, to glorify God for good. You know, I realize that some people online are watching right now and you feel discouraged. You feel like you're at your wit's end. You feel like you don't know what your next step's going to be. But can I tell you this? There are many people who have been in your position, and I believe that there's a secret in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the troubles that you're walking through, and that is praise and worship. You know, David said it like this. He said in Psalm 34, he said, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will never stop singing his praises. He says in verse 2, he says, humble people, listen and be happy while I brag about the Lord. He said, praise the Lord with me. Let us honor his name. Now check this out. Some of you need to hear this right now. I went to the Lord for help, and he listened. See, some of us, we try to go to the bottle. We try to go to the computer. We try to go to these different places that, don't, that only satisfy for a moment. But David had the secret. He said, I went to the Lord, and I asked for help. He said, he saved me from what I fear. What do you fear? What is the fear that's keeping you awake at night that's, that's fueling the anxiety on the inside of you? The very thing that's trying to steal your trust and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me tell you like this. He said, he'll put a smile on your face. You'll have no need to be ashamed. As a poor and helpless man, I pray to the Lord. Let's realize in this moment that we come and we praise when we figure out that there's nothing left on the inside and nothing left on the outside that can satisfy us. 
Amen. He said, and the Lord heard me and he saved me from all my troubles. I want to remind you that those who are listening today, it says that the Lord's angel builds a camp around his followers. Right now, there are angels in your home. There are angels in your job. There are angels protecting your children. There are angels. And when you begin to praise and worship, just like the saints did when Peter was in prison, the Bible says that an angel went and woke him up. Freedom of his shackles opened the prison door. Listen, this is while the church was worshiping. This is while they were praising Paul and Silas at midnight when they were at their wit's end. When they felt like they did everything they could do. The first thing wasn't complaints. The first thing wasn't running to alcohol. It wasn't running to drugs. It wasn't running to this, to different things that we run to. But it was running to Jesus. And the Bible says, and at midnight, the ground shook. Yeah. And all their shackles are falling. During this next time, this next song, can you just forget about all that's going on and set your mind on Jesus and make it up like David to bless the Lord at all times? Because some of you are about to walk into your miracle. praying and you still have no answers have you been pouring out your heart for so many years have you been hoping that things would have changed by now have you cried all the faith you had through so many tears don't forget the things that he has done before And remember he can do it all once more It's like the brightest sunrise Waiting on the other side of the darkest night Don't ever lose hope, hold on and believe Maybe you just haven't seen it, just haven't seen it yet You're closer than Problem. He sees the best in you when you 
How you doing, fellas? I'm Miles McPherson, pastor of the Rock Church here in San Diego and author of The Third Option, Hope for a Racially Divided Nation. It's my pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, I grew up in New York, wanted to play in the NFL, and in 1982, I was drafted to the Los Angeles Rams, got cut, which means I got fired, and went and played for the San Diego Chargers for four years. My first two years, I was doing cocaine, smoking marijuana, chasing women, running from women. And then one night, I uh, had done cocaine all night. It was five o'clock in the morning, and I finally surrendered my life to Jesus Christ after guys on the team were witnessing to me, sharing their faith with me, and I stopped doing cocaine in one day. On that day, I got back on my girlfriend, who's now my wife, 36 years, and went directly into ministry. And one day, as I was a youth pastor, I was, uh, went to Canada to, to speak at a conference. And I'm driving to this place in Kamloops up in the mountains, and I see these people falling out of the sky. They were parachuting. I had never done a parachute before. I was like, I always wanted to do it. And so I got out the car and went to the, to the parachute place and said, yo, man, I want to jump out of a plane. He said, okay, give me your money. We'll throw you out. So I gave him some money. They gave me you know, a little training for an hour or whatever. And then I got in the plane, put on uh, this strap, and I didn't have a parachute. I was going to have a guy on my back who I didn't even know. So here I'm going to jump out of a plane with a dude I don't even know without a parachute. And so they put me in the plane and I had an altimeter right here strapped on my body. And basically it tells you how high the plane's going up. So as the plane's going up, it said 1,000 feet, 2,000, 3, 4, 5, 12,000 feet, just about two miles up in the air. And then the plane levels off and it goes, sounded like it stopped. Then they opened the door. And you heard all this wind. And I'm thinking, we're two miles up. I know math. We're almost two miles up in the air, and the door is open, and I don't have a parachute. So I tell the guy in the back, I said, look, has anybody ever punked out right now? Like right now, say, I changed their mind. He goes, no, just one time this little 12-year-old girl, but that's about it. I said, all right, all right, I'm good. Just wanted to ask. So I'm, I'm on my knees because you can't stand up in the plane. Everybody's on their knees. And these people start jumping out of the plane. Ah! And I'm in the back. I'm thinking I'm going last. So we crawl over on our knees to an open door, 12,000 feet up in the air, no parachute. All I got on me is a guy who I don't even know. Just met him. First date, we're jumping out of a plane. And you get to the open door, and there's a bar right above the door. And they say, grab the bar. And he said, when I count the three, let go. And I'm thinking, I ain't letting go until I want to let go. You can count to 100, but I, I got guns, a little bit of little guns right here. And I'm not letting go until I want to let go. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. We are two miles up. So he counted one, two, and I let go. We dropped 120 miles an hour within like five seconds. And we dropped, dropped, dropped. And it was one of the most exciting things I had ever done. And the only way that could have ever happened is that I had to let go. I want to talk to you today about letting go of control of your life and surrendering your life to Jesus. Now, let me be clear what that means. Some of you have prayed a prayer in church before and you asked Jesus Christ to be your savior, but you have really not let go. You are still in control of your life treating your wife the way you want, watching stuff on the computer that you want, cursing like you want, eating like you want, doing everything the way you want, you haven't let go. Therefore, you are not experiencing the supernatural, incredible life that God designed you for. Then there's some of you, you've never asked Christ to be your savior. We're talking to you too, especially you, that today in a few minutes that you would tell God, God, I surrender my life to you. I'm going to read a little passage in the Bible, Matthew chapter 14. Let me give you a setup. Matthew 14, the disciples are going to be in a boat. Jesus is going to be in the mountains. A storm is going to come that I believe Jesus prayed for. The disciples are going to think they're drowning and Jesus is going to go out to them. And one of the disciples is going to step out of the boat. That's going to be you. So the, the thing about the story is that Jesus had prepared them for this moment. For, for years, he has been preparing them for him to leave and go to heaven. And what he's going to tell them is, look, I'm going to teach you all this stuff intellectually. I'm going to teach you spiritually how to walk supernaturally. And then I'm going to die and go to heaven. So this was one of those lessons. So the disciples had seen all these miracles because he was setting them up for this very moment that they would step out and trust him, which is what I'm going to challenge you to do, to let go, step out and trust him. 
He had healed a blind man. There was a guy who was blind, came to Jesus, and he said, are you willing to heal me? Jesus spit in the ground, made blood, mud with the dirt, and put the mud in his eyes and told the guy, go wash your face in the pool. And the guy washed his face, says, I'm going to come back and get you for spitting in my eye. He goes and washes his face, gets his sight. The disciples saw that. Jesus said, you see that? You're going to do that one day. There was a guy who was a leper. Leper. Leprosy was a disease that make your limbs curl up. You would get nodules on your vocal cords. You'd be like, ah, and, you, and, and they walk around and you would have to say, unclean, unclean. Because if you were a leper, you would have stayed th uh, 30 feet away from people because the leprosy could get off you and get on them. A leper came up to Jesus and said, are you willing to heal me? Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and healed him. Jesus said to his disciples, do you see that? You're going to do that. There was a guy who's crippled 38 years. Jesus went over to him and said, do you want to be well? And the guy said, I can't get in the water, which is where I'm going to get well. He said, I didn't ask you. All I want to know, do you want to be well? Yes or no? Sometimes God will ask you, do you want to be blessed? And we got all these excuses of why we, we can't say yes to God. Some of you right now got a whole bunch of excuses of why you can't say yes to God. Give up those excuses. So Jesus is doing all these miracles in front of his disciples, and he's telling them, you're going to do that one day. You're going to do that one day. Then 5,000 men, plus women and children, are in this field. No food. And Jesus says, feed them. They say, we don't have any food. They got five loaves of bread, two fish. Jesus gives it to the disciples, blessed it, broke it, and the disciples start giving away all this fish and bread to 5,000 men, plus women and children with leftovers, another miracle. And then he says, right after that, it's fresh in their mind. He goes, get in the boat, go to the other side. He goes up into the mountain to pray. They're out in the middle of the sea, three to 6 a.m., rowing, and they think the boat is going to sink because it's a storm. I believe Jesus prayed for the storm. That's just me. Jesus goes walking out on the water in the middle of the night. And I don't know if you've ever seen anybody walk like this, what we call a little tip. That's Jesus walking on the waves as the waves were going up and down. He's walking on the water, and they think it's a ghost. And Jesus said, it's not a ghost. And this is where we pick up the story. Now, understand this. The disciples are who we are supposed to be. Walking with Jesus, doing the miracles he does, speaking like he speaks, and he's setting us up to do a live a supernatural life. Just like when I jumped out of that plane, I could not experience the exhilaration, the excitement, of dropping 120 miles an hour unless I let go. You're not going to have the supernatural life God has for you unless you let go. You are not going to live the life God has for you. You're not going to have the joy, the power, the freedom, the peace, the clarity, unless you surrender to him 100%. Here's what, he Here's what happened. It says, in the fourth watch in the night between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus went walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walk on the sea, they were troubled and said, it's a ghost. And immediately he said, be of good cheer. Stop tripping. Be excited because something exciting is getting ready to happen. He said, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said, this is the thing. Jesus stand on the water saying, which one of my disciples is going to come to me? Which one of my disciples is going to let go of that bar and jump out of that plane? That's all he wants to know. You could talk all you want. And, and, and I am absolutely challenging you. You can talk all you want, but it's until you step out of the boat and say, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop trusting in this boat and I'm going to start walking by faith. I'm going to stop doing things my way. I'm going to do things your way. 100%. You're either in or you're out. And so here's Jesus standing on the boat, on the water, and his disciples are right in front of him. And he's like, I just fed 5,000. Y'all got it. You remember the blind man, the deaf, the crippled, the, the, the boy raised from the dead. You remember all that. So what you going to do? He didn't have to say it. He, him standing there is like, which one of y'all going to come and step out of the boat? And look what it says. It says, Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, first, you got to stop, stop go smoking cigarettes first. Mm -mm. You got to stop smoking weed first. Mm -mm. You got to clean up your language first. Got to cut your hair. Nope. He said none of that. I had used cocaine all night. I had never gone to sleep. So technically, I was still high to some degree. And I said, Jesus, I surrender my life. You know what he said? Let's go. So I don't care what your life situation is, and neither does Jesus. He wants you the way you are. So when Peter said, Jesus, call me to come to you on the water, Jesus said one word. It's real simple. Come. Come on. Let's go. You feel froggy jump. And it says, when Peter stepped out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So the question is, are you willing to step out of the boat 
and walk to Jesus. Simple. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means everybody, you and me. And that the penalty of sin is death. That means you realize you're not perfect and you're going to die. Physical and spiritual death. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for your sin. Easter, he rose from the dead. Good Friday, he died. We all know that's true. It's fact. Historical fact, Jesus lived, died, rose from the dead. His tomb is empty. Fact. So A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then C, commit yourself to him. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I commit my life to you. In a minute, we're going to pray, and you're going to have an opportunity to say, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died for my sin, and I commit my life to him. There was a guy who walked across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope, three hours. It took him three hours to walk across the tightrope, across the waterfall, and he got to the other side. He says, I'm going to go back and put a wheelbarrow on top of the wire so, and then fill it with dirt. So he gets on a wire, put, fills the wheelbarrow with dirt, and asked the crowd, do you believe I could take this wheelbarrow across the wire? They said, absolutely, we believe you are the best tightrope walker anywhere. So he looks at the little boy and says, do you believe I could take this wheelbarrow across the wire and drop no dirt? And the little boy says, I believe. He dumped the dirt out and said, then get in and go with me. If you're gonna pray with me right now, you're gonna let go and you're gonna step out of that boat? You are telling God, God, I'm stepping out of my sense of security and I'm stepping by faith into yours. I'm stepping out of my trust for my life, doing things my way, where I'm gonna trust you and do it your way. And you can't go back. But I can tell you this, if you give your life to Christ, you will have the most supernatural, incredible, un uh, unpredictable, exciting life you can ever imagine. He will bless you beyond what you can ask or imagine. It's a simple prayer. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin. And I commit my life to you. So I'm going to ask you right now, wherever you're at, bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to think about you, just you, not your family yet, not your friends, not your enemies, because you are going to stand before God by yourself. And you are going to be accountable only for you. And you're going to be accountable for what you did for this last 15 minutes of listening to me. Did you accept the truth of the word of God or did you reject it? So eyes closed, heads bowed. I'm going to pray for you and then I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. And as you repeat after me, you are going to be praying to ask Christ to be your savior. You're going to tell God, God, I'm getting out of the wheelbarrow. I'm getting in the wheelbarrow. I'm stepping out of this boat. I'm jumping out of the plane. Well, however you want to phrase it, but you are surrendering your life to Jesus. So eyes closed, head bowed, just listen to me and I'll tell you when to repeat after me in the privacy of your heart. Lord, I thank you for all these men. I thank you for your love for them. I thank you that right wherever they are, you are right there with them and you are affirming in their heart that you know everything about their life, their family, their secret, secret sins. You know it all, but you love them to death. And I pray in a minute when they have an opportunity to ask you to forgive them, they would make that decision by faith. Like Peter stepped out of the boat by faith. Like I let go of that bar and jumped out of that plane by faith. I pray by faith. They would just trust you with their life, their pain, and everything that has broken in their life, they would trust that you would heal it. If you would like to give your life to Christ, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I admit that I am a sinner and that the penalty of my sin is death. I believe Jesus loves me, that he died and rose from the dead. I commit my life to him. Please forgive me of my sin. Fill me with the Spirit of God. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. If you prayed that prayer, whether the first time or you are recommitting your life to Christ, you just establish a relationship with the living God. What's so important is relationship. You didn't join an organization. 
And in your relationship with friends, how do you develop it? You spend time with them, you speak with them, you, you, you do things together. That's all God wants to do with you. He wants to spend time with you. And how does that happen? Reading the Bible, prayer, fellowship, going to church. So I wanna encourage you to find some brothers that you can go to church with, study the Word of God, and begin this relationship, this journey with God, and He will transform your life. God bless you. I'm Miles McPherson. I'll see you soon. Men, that was an incredible message from Miles McPherson. But beyond it just being an incredible message, I know for some of you, this is an incredible moment. For some of you, it's the first time you've ever heard the good news of the gospel and you've accepted Christ into your heart for the very first time. I want to congratulate you. You have made an eternal decision that has transformed you in a way you fully haven't even been able to imagine. For those of you men who knew that story, who had maybe made that decision in the past, but you're coming back to that decision. You're saying, God, I, I wanna come back and follow you like I've never followed you before. I, I, I wanna follow in a way that's genuine and real the rest of my days. I wanna congratulate you too, because it's going to transform your journey. Thank you for doing that. And thank you to Miles McPherson for leading us in that way. You've now stepped out of the boat. You've jumped out of the plane and God has the most amazing, amazing story to tell through you into the world around you. But here's what I want to do. I want to ask us to continue to allow that moment to happen in our lives. I don't want to move us too far past it. I want to allow God to continue to go deeper in this moment, allow you to go deeper into this moment. And so if you're at church, we're going to have some music actually offered by our friend, Michael W. Smith, and he's going to lead us in a couple of songs where if you just need to come forward in church and ask for prayer from your friends, from your pastors, this is the time to do that, to say, I want to really seal that decision I made. Maybe you're at a home group with a couple of buddies and you just want to be honest and genuine with them and say, hey, I said that prayer under my breath. I need someone to walk me through this decision. And as we sing and worship, allow that to wash over that experience with you. And for some of you, you just want to worship. You feel the warmth of God moving in you and you want to celebrate. Join in with us and Michael W. Smith as we celebrate what God is doing in our lives. So check out and worship with us with Michael W. Smith. Hello, Promise Keepers. Welcome. Uh, even if we're virtual, we're grateful to be here. Uh, it's gonna be an amazing day. Uh, in the midst of all that's going on, God's still on the throne. We know how the story ends. He's still a way maker and he's still doing miracles. So, here we go.
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I can see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working.
What a powerful moment with Michael W. Smith, with Miles McPherson, with Jesus entering into so many of our stories for the very first time. We celebrate that with you. And I'm telling you, if there's one thing that Promise Keepers is all about, it's about helping reach men for Christ to see them transformed all around the world. And you've been part of that, but we have only just begun. This is just the beginning. So much more that God wants to do through the rest of this journey together. But before we go any further, what I want to introduce introduce you to is the Promise Keepers app. Promise Keepers has created an app for you men, just for you, for connection, for deeper relationship, for ongoing content, just like this, that's transformative, that speaks from men to the heart of men. And so what I want you to do is go to the app store on Apple or go to Google Play and download that app. It's gonna be feature rich for you to connect with other men, to continue to grow in your walk with the Lord. Now, if you did make one of those decisions and you said, God, like I, I need your son Jesus in my life and I'm making a decision, we also have a new believer's guide for you. We wanna help you take those first baby steps on that journey. And so we've prepared a believer's guide just for you. You can get it in the Promise Keepers app or you can go to our website, promisekeepers.org. There's a button, click on that button and download that new believer's guide. That is gonna guide you into these really important next steps over the next five days. It's really simple, but it's five days of steps you need to take to move from that place of decision into a walk of discipleship. So make sure you do that. All right, men, we're gonna take a break now, just a really short break. Uh, so catch your breath. There's so much more to come. And as soon as the break is over, you're gonna hear Phil Wickham. That's right, Phil Wickham has joined us. He has a song and a message he just wants to share with you. And so on the other side of the break, it's Phil Wickham.
Hey, Promise Keepers, thanks so much for tuning in. What an honor to be here with you guys to celebrate Jesus together, his amazing grace over our lives. Wherever you may be, let's celebrate. One, two, three, go. Oh. Sing who breaks. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is this is amazing grace this is unfailing love how you would take my There's a lot of passion going on around this country right now. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Jesus Christ prayed to his Father in heaven that we be one as he and the Father are one. He wouldn't have prayed that if it couldn't come true. But it hasn't come true in 2,000 years. 
Guys, this is our chance where we can make this come true across the world. Racial unity, class unity, denominational unity. It is the people of the Lord Jesus Christ that can make this all come together. So what do we do about it? Well, we're calling for Promise Six Sunday at Promise Keepers. We're asking for churches all over America and all over the world to come together and worship with people from a different experience. Because how we're gonna start to change this is through relationship. Through sticking our feet in the shoes of somebody else and walking around in them for a while. From trying to understand somebody else's experience. We gotta get out of our little niches and our little tribes and get into greater groups of Christians. It's okay to identify with our culture but it's not okay if our culture is our primary identity. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are a son or daughter of God. He died for your sins. We are one as a family. It's okay for us to come together. It's okay for us to disagree. We have to get over this idea that every time someone disagrees with us, we've got to run off and start a different church or go somewhere else. Let's stick together, even if we disagree. Let's come together on Promise Six Sunday and worship with each other, not just to do it for one time, but to form relationships that break down boundaries, to help us to understand each other. In America here, you you all know about the racial problems we've had. In India, where millions of you are watching right now, we've had class divisions. Across Africa, we've had deep denominational issues. We can heal this, guys. Jesus has given us his promise. He's given us his Holy Spirit to guide us into great unity. You know, we sit at a crossroads of history right now where we can either go French Revolution or American Revolution. The American Revolution was based on the idea that human beings get their rights from God, not the government, not from people. And because of that, we're all created equal. We believe in the scripture that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free man, but we are all equally loved by our Lord because he died for our sins. He died for your sins. The French Revolution was the oppressed against the oppressors. They rose up and they started beheading people. It was a bloody and awful revolution. And by the time all the smoke had cleared and all the people had been slaughtered, they just ended up with Napoleon. It's like the Who song, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Well, which way are we gonna go? Right now it starts to look like we're gonna go down the French Revolution path. The church must lead the way back to the American Revolution. As my good friend Oz Guinness talks about, we have got to go the way of the fact that our rights and our equality come from our God, not from government, not from anybody else. The church must lead the way. No more can we not let everybody have a seat at the table. We have to do this by being proactive, by reaching out to other people. So on Promise Six Sunday, let's get together. Presbyterians with Baptists, Catholics with Episcopalians, Lutherans with Presbyterians, across denominational lines. Let's have predominantly white churches with predominantly Asian, Hispanic, black, Arab churches. Let's come together as a one, as one people under the name of God. Hey, what's up, Promise Keepers? My name is Danny Gokey, and I wanna share this song with you. I believe it's the answer to our culture because it's what Jesus said. He said that the first and the greatest commandment was to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Come on. I've been running in circles, jumping the hurdles, getting caught in that brush of doing so much. I'm feeling kind of worn out. All this checking the boxes, trying to be flawless. Got me spinning my head, catching my breath. Too afraid to slow down. I tell myself to keep this up. That God wants more than just my love. I've been complicating things just like me to overthink. Gotta keep it real simple. Keep it real simple. Bring everything right back to ground zero. the kingdom knowing life can be found but love can be loud cause love is what it's all about I tell myself to keep this up God wants more than just my love no more complicated things no more need to overthink gotta keep it real simple keep it real simple bring everything right back to ground zero i 
It rescues hearts and changes lives Love is all we need To make things right Gotta keep it real simple son died, I thought about killing myself. Would you be shocked or pity me or judge? What if I told you I know I'm not the only one? What if you knew you weren't alone? What if this world was filled with the voices of men who stopped denying their pain just to make others feel comfortable? Let them squirm in the awkwardness of your reality. So what? What if we stopped worrying about what others thought to maintain unspoken rules we never agreed to? For what? What if we were honest liars, right? Well-built, but worn down, winsome, but weak. What if you could be honest? How sometimes you wish you would have married somebody else. So you watch porn. What if we really had freedom of speech? What if you stopped? What if you stopped overtelling your successes and undertelling your failures? What if you stand up? What if you stand up even if you have to go alone and screamed into the shattered mirror of your existence, enough is enough? What if you stand up and thousands stood with you, proclaiming the promise of that kind of love? What if what if became what now because I'm about that life, being fully known and yet fully loved, where everyone can feel safe, running, resting? living in his amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I see. I see. What's up, Promise Keepers? I know you thought you could get rid of me, but I'm not. You know who I am. I'm your brother from another mother. It's Reggie. I'm in the house, and not only am I here now, but next year, we're getting together under the same roof. You got to get to Arlington, Texas, July 16th and 17th. Get your reservation now. The home of the five-time world champion Dallas Cowboys and Promise Keepers. Come on, brothers. Make sure that you're there. Make sure you get your ticket, and make sure you're with us. Today is a great day. Hopefully you've enjoyed yourself. God has moved, touched hearts of men and teenagers alike, but we're going to make this happen. It might be virtual now, but guess what? Next year, we're going to be live and living large. You have to come and be a part. Now, you and I both know it takes more than just one man registration to make Promise Keepers happen. Promise Keepers is trying to help men who may not even be able to get money to come to this event. 
been. So we are taking up an offering this year and planting a seed for next year. So now is your chance to give and help promise keepers. We want teenage boys who have never been into a room like that, to hear singing like that, to hear preaching like that, to be in that room next year. Your offering is going to help us do that. We want to translate this promise keepers event in other languages around the world. We get to do that because of your giving. So if you're in a church group, you guys are going to take up an offering. We know you're going to do that. If you're by yourself, there's a give button right there. Just push it and give with us. And as you give, I think I might need to drop a little saxophone on everybody. So everybody do me a favor. Get your offering. Get ready. Hit that click button. Start doing this. I'm going to play a little something. You, dude with the popcorn, put the popcorn down and get your offering ready. All right? Here we go. God bless you, and God bless Promise Keepers. I can remember when we first introduced this song to the Promise Keepers band, and uh, no one had ever heard it before. And as we went through the lyrics and how the guys are going to play it, there came a moment when no one could play because they were all weeping, because the song and the melody, the lyrics, they captured the hearts of worshipers. And it was an expression of the deepest desire of every promise keeper to know him. And we began to sing this song in all of the stadiums. And at one point, they captured various versions in various stadiums. And I remember playing that version of it to our congregation. And at that time, we were trying to recruit men for the Promise Keepers event that was going to take place in my city. And when we played that video of men worshiping all around the nation, singing, knowing you, all of our registrations were filled and completed. So when we sing this song, it became almost like the theme song of a promise keeper, knowing you. This is my greatest joy to know him. And of course, as we sang that song, we saw countenance has changed. We saw the presence of God just come and fill the place, and it was life transforming. We're passing this on to a generation that has been created to praise the Lord. I love that psalm that says, this will be written for a generation yet to be created who will praise the Lord. I'm hoping that you will praise the Lord and that you will be that generation to continue to sing knowing you.
possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there. my righteousness and I love you Lord Oh to know the light of your risen life Oh to know you your sufferings to Become like you in your death, my Lord. So with you to live and never die. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there. It's a great song to sing, but it's a more powerful truth to embrace. What's going on, Promise Keepers family? It's John Gray. I'm honored to spend some time with you all to be a part of what I believe is a most necessary ministry movement that now more than ever needs to come to the forefront. I just wanna share a couple of thoughts around the idea of God's amazing grace and his restorative power. This particular story starts in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is taking a walk with some of his homeboys, the 12 disciples, the ones that he prayed all night to get a word from the Father and then chose 12 who would become apostles. And as he was walking near the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asks this seminal question. It is 
the foundational question of humanity. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Some began to answer. Some say Elijah. Some say uh, the prophet, John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah. He said, but who do you say that I am? The foundational question in all of humanity is who is Jesus to each individual? Is he simply a historical figure from an antiquated book that has no bearing on today's life, times, and society? Or is Jesus the central figure in all of human history, the fulcrum around which all of existence revolves? And out of this question, one man blurts out, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. His name was Simon. And in this moment, Jesus looks at him and says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you because you are not that bright. My father in heaven gave you this revelation. And now I call you Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Peter, Petros, stone from a bigger stone, actually uh, symbolizes the revelation that Jesus would build the church on, not the humanity of the person for no human being can carry the weight of the church, but we can all play our role in pushing the kingdom agenda forward. From this moment, Peter, who got the profound revelation of who Jesus was, we see the dichotomy of his humanity. We see him go from profound revelator to less than a, a chapter later, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you are mindful of the things of man, not of God. He goes from getting a revelation from God to literally be called, to, to literally, he's being called the adversary. It's important to note that at all times, Peter was two things. And the truth is, no matter how saved you are, no matter what you present to the world, man of God, the truth is, we are never one thing in totality. The war and the tension in our manhood is the distance between who we present and who we actually are. And until the blood of Jesus brings these two uh, poles together, there will always be tension. And just because I'm saved doesn't mean that I'll be sinless. The blood of Jesus is available and necessary and active for those of us who fall at the foot of the cross and say that I cannot in my own will, strength, or righteousness attain to the level of holiness that is expected of an eternal perfect God but we get to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith in him, and the blood has paid the price. Restoration, not through works, but through the finished work of the cross. The power of this story is not that Peter got a revelation of Jesus. The power of this story is that throughout every area of Peter's life, Jesus always had his eye on who he was developing, not what he was struggling with in the moment. From Matthew 16, we can travel to John chapter 18. As we're nearing the end of Jesus' life at the Garden of Gethsemane, here come some, some angry people, a mob of people coming to arrest Jesus for heresy. We want him dead. He has offended the law. And as they're coming to arrest him, all of his disciples scatter, including Peter. Peter follows closely while he's warming himself by a fire. A little girl says to Peter, aren't you one of his disciples? And he says, no, I don't know him. I ain't never seen him. I don't know who he is. She says, no. Matter of fact, you have an accent. You were hanging with the Galilean, aren't you? Aren't you? Are you sure you don't know him? And he denies him three times total. The Bible says, and immediately a rooster crowed. And in that moment, we see the brokenness of Peter. The Bible says Jesus looked at him and he began to weep bitterly. He ran out and wept bitterly. Please note that anything that is in scripture is necessary for us to understand. The detail about Jesus looking at Peter and Peter weeping bitterly is important because if you study the Mishnah, if you study the oral tradition of Jewish history, you will realize that if you deny your rabbi, it is an irreversible, irrevocable breakage of relationship. There is no restoration that is allowed when you deny your rabbi. 
Peter wept bitterly because he knew that what he did in that moment of self-preservation had forever cut him off from relationship with Yeshua HaMashiach. He knew it was over and he wept with the reality that the one that he loved, the one that he got the revelation of, was now forever disconnected because of his own doing. And before you shake your head at Peter, you and I should take a look at ourselves, the decisions we've made, the things you and I have done wrong, but the Bible makes it clear that all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God. I, chief among them. Strange thing about Jesus, his whole life was about reconciliation. His whole life was about healing and restoration. His whole life was an extension of grace. His blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. He couldn't even die without saving somebody next to him. This is the king that we serve. And while you and I battle through foolish things like denominationalism, classism, and colorism, Jesus is saying the only color that matters is red and it's the blood of Jesus. And if you wanna know how Jesus deals with broken people, let me give you a note because in John 18, it was over. Peter had no chance to be restored. Oh, but in John chapter 21, Early in the morning, Peter says to the disciples, y'all, I'm going fishing. Translation, I'm going back to what I know. Jesus is dead. I think this is over. I'm not sure what's real. And the, the disciples said, I'm going to go with you. Of course, they catch nothing. But then there's a voice from the shore asking, have you caught anything? They said, nothing yet, Lord. Nothing. So don't you put your net on the other side. And Peter immediately says, that's the Lord, and he dives into the water head first, gets to the shore and what is waiting on him. There's a fire and there's fish baked on hot coals and bread. The very thing he was fishing for had already been prepared. All he needed to do was get to the shore, get back to the presence of Jesus. And if you've ever had a moment where you've been disconnected from fellowship because of your own doing, Number one, kudos to you for taking personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is critical in moments of true transformational change. Peter gets to the shore and the very thing he was fishing for, Jesus had waiting on him. And then Jesus asks Peter three times, hey, Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. You love me? Feed my sheep. You love me? Tend to my sheep. From lambs to sheep. Peter, if you love me, you will walk with people from their baby infant stage into the place of maturity. And when they get to the place of maturity, keep walking with them because they're sheep after all. One of the tragedies of contemporary Western Christian thought is that there are very few places that kill their wounded quite like the church. The truth is, while you're looking at me on the other side of this screen, you've got some things that you don't want anybody else to know about, but God knows it already. So before you and I throw anyone away for the things we know, we should probably thank God for the things that he did not allow anyone to know. And I say that not out of judgment, but out of heart of humility, a heart of grace, grace that was extended to me, grace that I now extend to others. And I pray that if you've never found yourself in a broken moment like Peter, that you would still extend grace to your brothers and sisters who are believers and extend it in hopes to one day never need it yourself. So Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. Jesus says, tend to my lambs. And in this one moment, three questions he does in three questions what the church fails to do over years. When someone falls, we leave them there to fend for themselves, often hurting, sitting in guilt and shame when the blood of Jesus was shed so that we can be free from the law of sin and death. And my prayer is that we as men of God 
will see our wounded the same way the military sees their wounded. They don't leave them on the front lines to die, but valiant men go and get the wounded and pull them back to safety and nurse their wounds in an effort to get them home. My prayer is that we would do the same, that when you see a brother that's overtaken in a fault or broken or lost or hurting, that you don't judge them unworthy of the blood or unworthy to serve, but that we get them to the safety of Jesus Christ, who will restore them the way he restored Peter. If we understand the history of the Bible and the culture of the Bible, you would know that it was the greatest miracle that Jesus did to restore Peter. And he didn't heal him in his physical, he healed him in his spirit. And Peter went on to live a life of extraordinary service because he was a recipient of extraordinary grace. You wanna talk about amazing grace? We can talk about Peter, you can talk about me. I know what it's like to be the, the flavor of the month, the one that everybody looks to, still harboring places of deep brokenness, shame, and fear. Me, I almost lost my entire family because I had not handled my pain properly. And I found myself in the darkest moment of my life. And I could have taken my own life and I could have thrown ministry away. But there were valiant men who grabbed me and said, you keep breathing and you keep living through this moment because your purpose is bigger than this, this temporary place of pain and bad decision. I say this to you, not from uh, an academic place, but from a, an experiential empirical place. I know of the grace of God. I know of the mercy of God. I know of the restorative power of the blood of Jesus. God has never thrown any of us away for our worst moment. Because the truth is we are neither our worst moment or our best moment. We exist somewhere in between. And my prayer is that the same grace that covered you in your worst moment, you will extend to other men when they are in that moment themselves. Jesus, the one who extends grace to all. Jesus, whose blood is enough to forgive us of our sins, Jesus the one who did it for Peter, the one who does it for you and I. And my prayer in this moment of great division is that we don't put our politics above the cross, that we don't put our denomination above the cross, that we don't put our preference above the cross, that we would lay down our culture and pick up the kingdom. This is my prayer. This is my heart. And in that, we will experience Amazing grace mm -hmm. Mm Father, we just ask your presence come right now and your spirit break out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
men, I'm gonna ask you to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we are living in perilous, troubling times. And we're asking now, God, that you would give us a clear word from heaven, that you would speak to us, that you would produce change in us, God, that could cause change in your church and yes, change even in this nation. Holy Spirit, come and speak to our hearts now, we pray in the matchless name of Jesus. And God's men said, amen and amen. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, a character by the name of Marcellus is talking to his friend Horatio and he said the famous words, there is something rotten in the state of Denmark. Beloved, I think it's obvious if we're paying attention to what's happening right now in American culture, that there's something not just rotten in the state of Denmark, there is something rotten in the United States of America. There's something rotten in the church. Something has to change. And I wanna spend the next few minutes talking to you about the key to change. I wanna draw your attention to Jonah chapter three, and of course, many of us know the story God had called Jonah on an unusual mission that was interrupted by a large fish. Jonah finally gets his act back together and is gonna obey God, and God in Jonah chapter three, verses one through 10, gives us insight to this whole story that will give us insight to the change that needs to happen. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It means to be overturned to the point of destruction. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but it let each man and his beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way and God turned from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Men, first of all, I wanna draw your attention to this fact. God loved Nineveh. God loved Nineveh. It didn't matter how wicked or evil they were. It didn't matter that they were the sworn enemy of Israel. God loved them. God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. God, by giving them this warning, was inviting them to turn and to repent. God loved Nineveh. Hebrews chapter 12, verse six says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and disciplines and corrects so that healing can happen, so that restoration can happen. Man, I wanna tell you, if you are in a place in your life right now that you know you need to repent, do not listen to the devil. Do not think that there's no hope for you. God loves you and he is inviting you as he did the ancient Ninevites to repent. He's asking you to turn from your wicked ways, turn from your evil ways. God loves you and he's got a plan for your life. There's no question about it. Secondly, as we've seen, God warned Nineveh. Think about this. Eight simple words saved an entire nation. Eight words, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown or overturned. Think about it. Eight simple words saved an entire nation. Those eight words so packed, so filled, so pregnant with the power of heaven. Those eight words, listen to me, that were so void of any hopeful promise. 
that when the Ninevites experienced the power, as well as the absence of a hopeful ending, it shook them to their very core. Listen, friends, if the Ninevites in their day with their wickedness, with their perilous times, if the Ninevites repented without any hope, how much more should we in America today be repenting knowing that God will give us a very real and certain living hope in Jesus Christ? We can learn a tremendous lesson from the ancient Ninevites. Number three, thank God the Ninevites responded correctly. The passage tells us that they believed God they believed God's prophet, they believed God's message, they believed God's word. They came under such unbelievable conviction because of their own wickedness that they, they knew that God was just in, in telling them that he was going to destroy them. They believed God's word. And because they believed, they fasted. They humbled themselves in sackcloth and ashes and beyond that, they cried mightily to God. Men, listen to me. When sin is at the point that it is in in the United States of America today, we cannot pray a one cent prayer and expect a million dollar answer. We've gotta, we've gotta imitate the ancient Ninevites who from their heart in genuineness with a passion and a zeal, they cried out to God mightily with everything that they had. They knew, listen to me, that repentance was their only hope. Turning from their wickedness was the key to seeing the change that needed to happen in them personally and in the entire nation corporately. Nineveh responded correctly by turning from their evil and the violence that was in their hands. Now I find this fascinating, friends. It says that this revival, if you will, this repentance started with the regular people on the streets, that they first responded and it became so powerful, so famous and so contagious that the king ended up hearing what was happening in the people. In other words, it went from the people all the way to the palace. And when the palace got word of what was going on, the king made a decree that covered the whole land and said, listen, we've got to humble ourselves before God. We've got to turn from our wicked ways and the violence that we've been doing. And here's what he says. Listen to this, friends. He says, who knows? Who knows, maybe God himself will turn as we turn. Think about that. Listen, friends, he's, he's risking something here. He's, he's gambling, if you will. He's throwing the dice and says, we don't know if God will actually turn based on our turn, but let's give it a chance. Let's see if God won't respond to us with mercy. Again, they repented without a promise. How much more should we be repenting in the church and in the nation when we've been given tremendous promise? Church, men, can you imagine what would happen if we all owned in our own hearts those areas of confession of sin and repentance of sin? If we did it in such astounding numbers that what happened in us, just regular old people, made its way all the way to the President of the United States so that he himself calls for a day of national repentance to cry out to God and to save us in our nation's turmoil and trouble. We've got biblical precedence for this to happen, men. Get beyond your own sin. Think about the sin of the church. Think about the sin of the nation and let's together own our stuff and cry out to God for mercy. Let's believe that what he did in Nineveh in years gone by, he can do in our day and our time right now. Come on, somebody, this is real stuff we're talking about. Their turn prevented them from being overturned. Their turn caused God to turn Men, listen to me, it's our turn. 
It's our turn in two different ways. It's our turn, in speaking of the genuineness, the sincerity, the quality of our turn that causes God to turn. It's gotta be real. It's our turn. But friends, beyond that, I believe with all of my heart, it's our turn. I'm not talking about just the quality and the sincerity and the genuineness of our turn. It's our turn in terms of time. It is our turn now. It is our turn as men of God to cry out to God, to repent of our sin, to believe for God to do something, to save our entire nation. The time is now. It's our turn and it's our turn. Now, friends, this isn't just a one-time thing for Nineveh. Listen to what God said through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8. God said, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down and to destroy it, listen to me, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, God said, I will turn of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Any nation, that means the United States of America, any nation, not just ancient Assyria, the Ninevites, us right here, right now. God invites us to repent. God invites us to turn and he gives us the promise that he will then turn and he himself will relent. Friends, what is preventing us from repenting? What is preventing us from acknowledging our waywardness? Pride, arrogance, ignorance, unbelief, what is it? We've gotta come to our senses. We've gotta be like the boy in the prodigal son story who had said when he was in the pig mud, he came to himself and said, I will arise and go to my father. We've gotta come to our senses, America. We've gotta come to our senses, men, and we've got to return to God. We've got to repent. How do we know? How do we know when a nation needs to turn from its evil? Does God give signs? He surely does. Second Chronicles 7, 13, God says this. God says, when I send drought, when I send devouring, the devouring of locusts, and when I send disease or pestilence, there's the three things, drought, devouring, and disease. He said, when it comes into the land, then, verse 14, if you'll humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn, from your wicked way. Then he said, I'll hear from heaven, forgive your sin, and heal your land. Does God give signs? Surely he does. He gives signs in nature itself. I think of 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse one, where it says that there was famine in the land of Israel for three consecutive years. And King David inquired of the Lord and cried out to God and said, God, why are we under this famine? And God let him know it was because of the sin of King Saul that brought this famine on the land. So whether it's drought, devouring, or disease, whether it's famine, or as we'll see in Ezekiel's day, corruption. God gives us these signs in nature and in culture to identify the fact that it is time for us to repent. In Ezekiel chapter 22, The prophet writes and says, the prophets, the priests, the princes, and the people, they're all corrupt. How does a nation know when it needs to repent? When you see these signs of drought, devouring disease, famine, and corruption? When you see prophets, priests, princes, and people? When you see religious, political, and societal corruption, it is time to repent. These are signs from God that he gives us in hopes that we'll wake up. Friends, have you considered where the United States of America is today? Has God given America any signs? Surely he has. Friends, listen, do you... Do you know what the United States of America leads the world in? 
Oh, you might say we lead the world in missions giving and we lead the nations in, in providing freedom. And yes, there's plenty of incredible, great things that the United States of America leads the world in. But maybe there's some signs that God's giving us to let us know here in the U.S. that it's time to repent. America leads the entire world in illegal drug use. America leads the entire world in prescription drug use. We lead the world in women who are on antidepressants. We lead the world in car theft, rape, murder, the total number of crimes and incarceration. We lead the world in all of these things. We lead the world by a long shot in the production and distribution of pornographic material. Nearly 90% of all, all pornographic material is produced and distributed from the United States of America and the rest of the world combined is only responsible for 10%. There might be a problem here, friends. We look beyond that. By a long shot, the United States leads the world in divorce and in abortion. We know the facts since 1973, over 63 million babies have been aborted in this country alone. One and a half million per year. Innocent children slaughtered in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Friends, I'm here to tell you, God has a problem with this. And his silence over the last 47 years, his silence is not his compliance. His silence is his patience waiting for us to come to our senses. When will we? Now, with all of these happening in the United States of America, you would think we surely understand what's going on and we're gonna start doing the right thing. I wish that was the case because my final example I'm gonna give you is the United States leads the world in watching TV. While the Titanic of the United States of America is sinking, we are channel surfing. Think about that, think about that. Seven months ago, if I would have told you that there's a global virus that's gonna come and infect millions of people, that hundreds of thousands of people would be dead, that the entire world economy would be rocked, people would be quarantined in their homes, depression would be up, suicide, addiction, and abuse, all would be skyrocketing, that there would be rioting, rebellion, and violence in the streets. If I would have asked you seven months ago, does that sound like the judgment of God on a nation and on the world, you would have said, absolutely, what could be beyond that? Friends, why is it now then that we don't have the insight and the courage to say we are clearly under the judgment of God? Can't we see the signs? Don't we know how they conflict with the character, nature, and purposes of God? Are we so blind? Are we so deaf that we've lost touch with who God is and what his will is all about? These are perilous times, friends, and we've got to wake up. You see, it's always easier to say something else is the judgment of God because it's distant, it's foreign. We don't have to answer for it. We don't have to respond to it. We don't need to repent if it's over there, but it's here now and God is requiring us to make a decision are we going to repent and turn from all of the things that are contributing to the peril and turmoil in our country and in our churches or are we too busy channel surfing to even care or to recognize what's happening in our land <laughs> friends we've become so addicted to 
offending one another and being offended by other people? I don't hear anybody asking the question, hey, do you think we've offended God? When's the last time you've thought about that? Even about your own life, your own sin. Has my sin offended God? We don't think this way anymore, and that's what's contributed to the problem. Listen to me. Our happy, hippie image of Jesus, rather than the son of God with a flame in his eye and a sword that comes out of his tongue, our misconception of who Jesus is and what he requires of us has contributed us to be us being asleep at the wheel right now in human history. Condoning our own sin, making light of it, not recognizing what's happening around the world. Sins of commission, things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. Sins of omission, not doing things that we should be doing. Spending more time looking at pornography than reading God's word. God is offended. God is offended. And it's time for us to turn and answer his promise that he'll heal us if indeed we turn. It seems like we've tried everything else but turning. Friends, it is our turn. It is our time to turn. We've tried to be relevant. We've tried to be flashy and hip and cool. We've put on productions that we call church meetings. We've got laser lights and fog shows going on. We've got people coming in week in and week out. They come in week and they leave week because we've got weak pastors preaching weak messages, producing weak followers of Jesus, and it's got to stop. Our only hope is repenting and turning to God with everything that we've got. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, Pastor Steve, that's that's some Old Testament story. That doesn't apply to the New Testament and Jesus is much more gracious now and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) Let me encourage you to read your entire Bible. In fact, let me encourage you to read the very end of it. In Revelation chapter two and and chapter three, Jesus writes seven love letters to his church. Listen to me, friend. Five of the seven churches, Jesus calls to repent. Five of the seven. In fact, in Revelation 3.19, Jesus said these words to them there, and he says it to us now. Listen to me, friend. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, means to discipline, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, Jesus says to his church, therefore, be zealous and repent. Turning from our sin, seeking God with with a genuineness of sorrow. Not having worldly sorrow that we got caught, but having godly sorrow that we've offended God and broken his law and need his mercy. It is godly sorrow that leads us to repentance and life. Friends, I wanna invite you. I wanna invite you right now, regardless of where you are. If you're watching on your phone somewhere, computer, if you're gathered with men in churches, wherever you are right now, I wanna ask you to take an examination of your own heart, of your actions in sincerity. Be honest. Where are you? Where is your life with Christ? Where do you need to repent? Because if men will repent, the church will repent. And if the church will repent, I believe the nation will repent. And if the nation will repent, we will see God heal our land. And we need it. We need it desperately. So wherever you're at right now, I'm gonna ask you to join me. I'm gonna ask you to join me by getting down on your knees. Come on, I'm not doing this just to lead you. I'm doing this with you. I want you to join me. Get on your knees. If you're at a church and you can move forward to the altar, go to the altar right now. 
don't wait. Don't let anybody hold you back. Why would you let anybody hold you back from repenting when God says, if you do, I'll heal you? Get on your knees and let's together pray, confess, repent, turn. It's our turn. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you love us enough to challenge us, to convict us, and to correct us. We thank you, O oh God, that you love us enough to offer us forgiveness through this shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've invited us to come and reason together with you. Though our sins be red like scarlet, they can be made white as wool. Lord, we come now to confess our sin. We're reminded of your beautiful loving promise that if we will confess our sin and, and our unrighteousness, our wickedness, God, that you'll be faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we confess we repent and we turn, not just for a moment, not just until tomorrow. We are determined by the grace of God and the power of God's spirit to turn from our wicked ways. God, help us. God, have mercy on us. God, give us a fresh start just like you promised. Lord, we know it's our turn. And so we take our turn. Now, Lord, will you turn? Turn from judgment. Turn from fierce anger. Cleanse, forgive, restore, revive. We ask it in the matchless name of Jesus the strong son of God, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you men. Walk in the newness of life by the power of God's spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Men, I don't know about you, but I feel broken. I feel like in this moment, there was a fresh conviction from the Holy Spirit that there's so much more for me, that, that it's time to repent. So I'm with you, I'm just gonna get down on my knee and I'm gonna be here with you and I'm gonna pray and ask God to cleanse me of every wrong, every fault, every falling shortness. But here's what I know, God is faithful to cleanse us. God is faithful to wash away those sins as white as snow. God is faithful to take what we've done where we've fallen short and bring us into a place of restoration, a place of healing. But what he wants to do is he washes that away. For some of us, man, we've hurt others. We've hurt our wives, we've hurt our children, we've hurt those around us. And, and there's a rebuilding that needs to happen. It, there's a washing away clearly that Steve called us to, a place of repentance. We're in that moment right now. We're gonna continue that posture of repentance but we need to rebuild a foundation. And so Evan Wickham, Phil's brother, is going to lead us in building that foundation back. So if you're on your knee, just cry out to God, God, rebuild the foundation. May my life be built on your foundation. So I'm gonna pray with you, Father God, as Steve just led us in prayer, I'm gonna echo what he said. God, we repent. We, we recognize our wrongs. We recognize we have chosen other gods. We've chosen other idols. And we, we've lusted after all sorts of things. But God, you are faithful. And God, we pray that you would restore what we've stolen. You'd restore what we've broken. And God, as we make this commitment to a life of repentance, a life of surrender, a life that honors the women in our lives, the life that honors our family, the life ultimately, God, that honors you, God, would you rebuild that foundation? God, make that the cry of our heart tonight, that you would rebuild that foundation for your name's sake, for your glory, in Jesus' name.
Hey, Promise Keepers, it's so good to be with you wherever you are. I know we're scattered all around, but we're together in the spirit. Um, the beauty of being the body of Christ is that the Holy Spirit unites us even in crises like this. So uh, let's, let's all join in this song together and sing, Worthy is the name of Jesus. We build our lives on him. He's the cornerstone. Uh, so let's sing that together right now.
Spirit, would you come and would you magnify Christ in our lives? May others, the ones that are closest to us, may they see much of Jesus in our lives. We've been through a lot this year. All of us have been through a lot. And so, Lord, we recognize that the solution for all of human grief, anxiety, depression, and angst, it's all found in the Messiah, Jesus who is coming to make all things new. And right now you wanna make our hearts new. You wanna meet us here in this place. So would you come, remind us of simple acts of love and acts of devotion that we can do to build and rebuild ourselves on you. Have your way in us, we pray in Jesus' name. All right, men, what a night this has been. I told you from the beginning, we felt like God was gonna speak to you to bring you hope, to bring you opportunity for transformation. And I believe you've genuinely experienced that once, if not twice, if not more tonight already. And and we are just getting started. We've got so many great things to happen tomorrow. So for the evening, we're gonna dismiss. We're done for the night. But as you leave, I wanna remind you of a couple things. First, go to the App Store or go to the Google Play Store and download the promise. Promise Keepers app. We want you to be involved, finding community, getting more content, and being connected to other men through Promise Keepers who want to live their life for the glory of God. If you were one of those men who made a decision for Christ or renewed your decision for Christ, in that app is a believer's guide that you can download to help you take those next steps or simply just go to our website and download that believer's guide right there off our website, promisekeepers.org. Now, there's so much more to come tomorrow. Prepare your hearts remain in that posture of repentance, of receiving, of allowing God to strip away what needs to be stripped away so that he can rebuild that foundation. We're gonna build on top of that tomorrow. I'll see you then. Our nation is in crisis. Men have lost sight of their God-given responsibilities. The number of men who no longer work has almost tripled since 1950. 68% of Christian men view pornography regularly. More than one in four children in America live without a father in the home. Nine out of 10 people incarcerated are men. 85% of them had no father figure. Now more than ever, America needs a revival of godly men, of promise-keeping men. Today, we've heard from some of the most influential pastors, thought leaders, and activists for change in our nation. And we're just getting started. Join us tomorrow as we dive deep into the world and hear what it has to say about a variety of important topics. We want to shake the foundations as we worship together. We won't rest until we've brought radical revival into this country. And we need you.